I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Chris Herbina. He's our medical officer for the city and county of Brimfield. And I've worked with Chris for 12, 12 years. Uh, and he's an amazing guy. Uh, Chris uh, um, and I go back to his days uh, when he was the uh, executive director at uh, Denver Public Health. He moved on to become the executive director at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And now he's serving as our medical officer and a family physician for Clinica. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Chris, but I wanna thank everybody for coming out and we look forward to this continuing to be a dialogue and conversation we have in our community. Great, thanks Jason. I, I've, I'm on uh, speaker. I'm gonna grab the clicker from up here as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jason, for the nice introduction. Um, and if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead and sit down here and just talk. Um, and we'll show the slides and we'll, we'll have a conversation. Um, I'm Chris Urbina. I'm the medical officer for the city and county in Broomfield. And I have the pleasure of working with a great team here in Broomfield. Kaylee Becker, uh, who's right here, and she'll be speaking, saying a few words in a, in a few minutes. And I help put this t presentation together. Well, our hopes are this, that, that all of you can see the power of of you as parents, of community members, of, of, of families, to really try to tackle this issue around the heroin and opioid epidemic. But there are lots of people that are working on this, uh, so that you're not alone. But I do want to uh, encourage you that you have a lot of power, and we'll talk a little bit first about a case, we'll share some data, not only specific to Broomfield and Boulder, but also to statewide and, and in the country. We'll talk about potential solutions, and then we'll finally end with how you can get involved, uh, because there's a lot of things going on. Um, so how many people have heard about uh, this heroin epide opioid epidemic? Good. So you're a little bit aware of what, what's going on. So I thought I would level the playing field by talking about a case. So this is a typical case. I happened to see this patient a while back. Jamie is a 20-year-old college student who comes to the ER asking for pain medications. He's already seen his primary care provider. Uh, his primary care provider said he had a sprained knee and that he should do the following things. This is what I would have done in this situation as a family doctor. Um, but not, not surprising, he goes and talks to one of his friends and his friend says, hey, I've got these pain medicines. Uh, take these and it'll take away your pain. Well, obviously, uh, it did take away his pain, um, but obviously the friend didn't ask for permission to take these narcotics from the pain medication, from the uh, medicine cabinet. And he wants pain medicines because he has a big game coming up and he doesn't want to miss it. Does this sound familiar to anyone? In what way? How, how, why does it sound familiar? In my line of work, I do a lot of, I'm a nurse, and I do a lot of education on the opioid epidemic. And um, the majority of the medications that are prescribed, whether it's after surgery or through the ER, um, most patients only take a few pills uh -huh. out of their okay. script. And then the rest are left sitting in cabinets, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of pills left over for this or the cleaning lady or the worker or the cousin or a friend to grab out of your so she, just for the sake of the camera, she did say that she's a nurse and, and what she's discovered, this is a very common problem in her community. Often the patients will only take a handful of medications and still have 30 or 40 still left in their cabinet. Yes, ma'am. I had a friend who had neck surgery and she believes that one of the care providers stole her pain medication out of her medicine cabinet. Really? So she had a friend who had pain, neck injury and had pain medicine and she believes that one of her friends took the pain medicine. Okay. Or worker. So diversion is a big issue. That's what we call this when people take it and give it to somebody else. It's diverted. Other people have a common experience like this? Okay. I, I think you probably have somebody in your family may have used opioids or even stronger drugs like heroin. Um, could this have been prevented? Yes. In what way? When you shake your heads, you say, why do you think it's, how could it have been prevented? Yes. Get lots of stuff. 
Good. She said, do I think this is a problem that doctors are providing too many medications uh, and it's prescribed, over, overly prescribed? And it's, she said it's also, her comment was, it's very easy. And yes, and we'll talk about that because uh, that's a big issue and we're, we're trying to tackle that problem. Any other comments uh, about this, this situation? Yes. Well, to me, the, the doctor at, in the ER did the right thing. He, he didn't, or she didn't prov provide any more pain relief, but the, the medicine cabinet is where the friend got it out of. So um, any of those unused opioids should have been either locked up or taken off to a drop site when they were no longer <laughs> needed and that wouldn't have happened. You should probably do this talk. <laughs> Because we're going to talk about those, because there are things that you can do as a parent, a family member, a, a local citizen, and there are some programs that are going on, because yes, these, this could have been prevented easily. Um, so. so let's talk about the national data first. You know, the amazing thing about this time period from the eight, uh, late uh, 1990s uh, to, to recently, you know, just a couple years ago, the use of narcotics has quadrupled, quadrupled. And I was a part of, uh, as a family dog, I prescribed a lot of narcotics because guess what? We thought that we needed to get rid of pain. So it was very common to go to a doctor's office and get a certain amount of pain medication. Some prescribed more than others. Um, and we'll talk about the uh, role of addiction. But it, it was very common to give out lots of pain medication because we thought we needed to get rid of pain. Um, so. And if you look at deaths related to opioid analgesics, this is also what we discovered at the same period of time. When uh, on the deaths per 100,000 population, you know, there's significant rise in the number of deaths in our population. And, and as we started to get smarter about opioids, started to decrease the amount of opioids, what happened? The same addicted folks started using other drugs, whether or not it's their synthetic uh, uh, opioids like fentanyl and, and other stronger medications you hear about in the paper started using heroin. So death started to rise significantly because, and I don't know if you, I'm currently addicted to brownies and, and some M&Ms, <laughs> but I've not died yet from my brownie addiction or, 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 or M&M addiction. But when people take too much opioids or too much heroin, you can die from that. So I, we tried to present a little bit of what's happening in Broomfield and, and Boulder County, but the problem with state data is that it's not specific. We, we, they lump the data aggregately, but let me tell you where Broomfield stands. In terms of deaths, we have roughly about eight deaths in the last five years related to heroin and about six deaths related to opioids in the last five years related to overdoses in opioids and heroin. So it's, it's here in Broomfield. Boulder's a little higher, but we can't present that data because it's an aggregate data. So we're about in the second quartile uh, when we look at uh, data related to Colorado. But the bigger issue, I think, as is, uh, this young woman here expressed, it's very common. People have access to drugs. And when you look at teenagers, 21% uh, of high school students believe it's sort of very easy to get a prescription, even without uh, a prescription to get uh, narcotics. They can get it from their friends very easily. And 15% of all teenagers in, in, in the city and county of Broomfield say they have used opioids without a prescription. Does that surprise you? Disturbing. I think it's higher. You think it's higher? Okay. I, I think in certain populations, yes. But when you look at the aggregate number, it, it's probably accurate. But yes, but we don't ask everybody. <laughs> And not everybody is fairly free to talk about this. So we're on the, in terms of use in Boulder and, and, and Broomfield, we're about in the third or fourth quartile. So use is common, but people aren't dying just yet. But that, this is just a matter of time, unfortunately. So when you look at, at use of narcotics and use of opioids, I wanted to give the other side of this coin. There was a local health department did this study when they talked about uh, heroin addicts. They talked to them, they asked them, where did you get your prescriptions? How did you come in contact with it? How did you first start? And this is pretty uh, uh, exemplary of other counties, and I just used this one because I had some data. They, when you ask these questions of, 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 of multiple users, um, did prescription painkillers play a role in their transition to heroin use? And over two-thirds of them said absolutely. 
And remember the data we talked about earlier as opioid deaths started to drop, drop heroin deaths started? So this is that transition that we're beginning to see. And when you look at divide them in half, where did they get them from? And half of them got them from their doctor, but more than half got them from a friend, got them, they sold, bought them on the street, and I can't believe it, 7% don't remember where they got them. Come on. <laughs> But it tells you that this is a very common problem, and this is representative of people who have used opioids and they make that transition to heroin. And these are just some comments from folks. And this is pretty typical uh, of, of folks that say that, that uh, still in pain, cheaper to get heroin, didn't want to, want to, but wish there were programs more help for it. No one wants to live like this. And if you talk to people that are addicted to opioids or heroin, they don't want to be in this problem. They don't want to be in this situation. But just like any other addiction, they're struggling with their substance use and abuse. And they want help, but they're stuck. And so we'll talk about some of the solutions. And, and does this make sense for folks? Okay. So let's talk about the big picture in, in terms of solutions. If you look at some of the data, and we talked about this nationally in Colorado and in Boulder, Broomfield, um, we can look at it from different perspectives. And I know this audience is about the public and about community. All of you have a significant impact in making decisions, parents and families. We talked about earlier schools. A lot of churches and, and, and faith-based organizations are beginning to get involved. Um, businesses are also beginning to see the downstream parts of this. You know, they're seeing people leave their businesses. We're seeing lots of people even in the library using and, and and abusing drugs. It's a, it's a very common sight. So community organizations are severely affected by, by this problem. So when you look at the public, and we're going to talk about the specific things that some of you mentioned, uh, safe use, obviously, in the case that we talked about earlier, if that primary care provider or the ER physician had made the decision that they were not going to give narcotics, and recommended uh, things like ibuprofen and naproxen, and there are lots of medications that are not habit forming, and physical exercise and ice and elevation, and said, no, we're not gonna give you narcotics. This is how we're gonna manage you. I think that's probably part of that safe use issue. And also, you as patients can request the same thing. You can refuse those narcotics. Your friend can recruit. No, I don't want that. I went to the... Oh, she needed it. Oh, she did. I went to my orthopod for my bad knee today, and he didn't offer me narcotics. I would have said no, but he said I needed an MRI. But ultimately, I guess if I have knee surgery, he's going to offer me narcotics, and I can say no. We'll see. <laughs> um, safe disposal, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. It, very common uh, issue in our community, what do I do with those unspent uh, narcotics? They're being diverted, I can guarantee you. We've talked about that earlier when you looked at the heroin users that started with opioids. They're being diverted to someone else. And as the head of the state health department in the past, I don't want you to toilet, throw them in the toilet. Uh, I want you to stick them in a, in a box and we'll talk about places you can take them to because I, I want you to throw them away and incinerate them as opposed to polluting our waters and streams with that. Obviously, naloxone, how many people have heard of Narcan naloxone? You see it a lot in the paper. It's a, it's a lifesaver when somebody is over, over, overdosed, but it's certainly not a prevention strategy. It's not a prevention strategy. It's to prevent death in the case of an uh, overdose. And I brought up that survey of the, um, of the clients who are addicted to heroin and opioids because right now we have stigmatized the drug users. They're all undercover. We've not, we've not done a, as good a job as we could in terms of getting into treatment. And there's treatment available, and we'll talk about some of those things. But we want to, particularly around pregnant moms and babies. The sooner we can get those pregnant moms to, to get off, get into treatment, the more we can prevent that baby from being addicted and then a lifelong use of, of heroin and opioids. So there's a lot of stigma, stigma reduction and harm reduction that we have to focus on. And you as a community, we, we have, need to uh, talk about this. I think currently the media is doing an OK job. They do a good job of creating the sensation around the death, the sensation around the abuse. But they not, and hopefully we'll turn the tide here in Broomfield, that we talk about 
the solutions that are being generated. And we're going to talk a lot about those today because there are fantastic websites, there are fantastic information, there are lots of things that are going on that the media should be talking about as opposed to the, the bad, badness that is really out there and consuming. I'm not going to focus on law enforcement. There's a lot of, lot of law enforcement that folks are doing. Obviously, they care a lot about this population as well. They're trying to get them into treatment. There are many law enforcement agencies that are trying to say, we don't want these, these young folks or these adults in jail. We want them to get treatment because there's this revolving door, as you know. If I'm addicted to heroin, I'm going to go steal or break a window or steal a purse to get my monies to buy heroin. So they are dealing with this as well, and they're dealing with lots of uh, case management issues. This is a mental health support and treatment. Clearly, um, many of our, our, our families are struggling with uh, homelessness. Uh, many of our drug addicts and our kids are dealing with lots of stressors. Uh, they need help, whether or not it's housing, mental health counseling and support. They don't, we don't necessarily have to treat all of our anxiety and depression or our pain um, uh, with narcotics or heroin, there are lots of things that we can get help with. And certainly, as you know, and you see this a lot in the newspapers, the emergency rooms and hospitals are overwhelmed with this issue. They're overwhelmed with the amount of addiction, whether or not it's a pregnant mom and a, and a baby in an ICU, or it's an emergency room that's dealing with the consequences of people that either have shooter's abscesses or are overdosed. So it's a complex issue, um, that, but you can see that we all have to be involved, and you as public and community can play a major role. So let's talk about safe storage. Somebody, I can't remember who alluded to this earlier. There are things that you can do in your household now with narcotics that you need to deal with your pain if you have to take pain. In the case of your uh, friend who had the neck surgery, clearly she needed the pain medication, but she can manage it. She can keep it locked up, monitor the medicine, make sure that, that you can secure it and keep it away from young people because uh, it, it's surprisingly not uncommon as we've learned about earlier. Safe disposal. There currently is one place closest to Broomfield, but I think there'll be other places in the future. Walgreens is, I think, beginning to do an excellent job. I don't know if you've been into a Walgreens right near the pharmacy. They have these locked containers. They're beginning to have more and more of these, and you'll see more and more, hopefully, because I think Walgreens and other chains are beginning to think this is an important part of their role as well. But please don't put them in the toilet. That's a bad thing for those fish <laughs> and beavers and other critters. Um, let's talk about teens. And I, I have to give credit to this fellow back here. I forgot your name. Kent. Kent. Uh, he and a group have put together this great resource for teens. It's uh, I Rise Above Colorado, but the other website is, is Rise Above Colorado. So I wanted to give them a shout out because this is, and I, you know, how many people have a smartphone? We all do. But our teenagers, our kids, all have smartphones. And they're searching all the time for information. But this is an excellent website. That's a resource that you can use. It talks about the truth, not the Wikipedia edition. It talks about how you can get information, what to do, how to deal with it, how to deal with anxiety, how to deal with depression, how to deal with pain in a very positive way. So I wanted to give a shout out for uh, uh, I Rise Above Colorado. That's the teen site. Rise Above Colorado is the general site. Is that right, Kent? OK. So let's talk about resources for parents. This is Speak Now Colorado. Um, and we're going to give you a resource list. We have this all written down. You don't necessarily have to copy this down. You can take this home with you. Speak Now Colorado is an available resources to talk, have this discussion in our community, whether or not it's parent to parent, parent to community organization, or parents to teens. And it tries to focus on your kids. So how do we arm our parents? And I don't know about your parents, but my parents never talked to me about this. You know, I had to go to medical school to learn about this. But, but we, we never had a discussion about how to arm our parents, and many of our parents, single moms or, or parents, we don't have a, a, a solid education on how to really speak to our teens. We just say, no. <laughs> and you know how far that goes, right? No, you can't do that. Yeah. So, but these are very concrete solutions. And I would encourage you all to look at this website. Again, you'll get a sheet of paper regarding the resources to talk about different age groups. And they have lots of resources to educate you about uh, whether or not it's, and I forgot to mention this earlier on, um, 
whether or not it's opioids or heroin, alcohol, marijuana, benzodiazepines, it doesn't really matter. It's the same risky behavior that we have to talk to our kids about. These are, this is an excellent resource for you to get access to that information. There are other crisis services, and I know these are very busy slides, and again, we'll give you the resource, but there is available counseling and crisis that you can use and call these numbers to make a difference. Um, and it's surprisingly how good these resources are. And I've not used this, but I have referred patients to do this, and they've had good success in getting information from the crisis hotline. This is available 24-7. And, and it's surprisingly not enough people, and particularly teens, are reaching out. I know this is a very complicated slide, but we, again, find treatment. You can see all the dots. If you look at our area, obviously there's more in the Denver metro area, but there are lots of, and as um, Kaylee and, and other folks in our Broomfield City and County Health Department discover, there are lots of private and public health partners that are helping get, lead the way in, in getting mental health support. Mental health partners in our Health and Human Services is one of the largest. We just met with their uh, COO today, and she's very interested in supporting our efforts, and she's actively involved in our community group that Kaylee will talk about in a second. So I'm going to turn it over now to Kaylee, who's going to talk a, a little bit about what we're doing and how you can get involved, and then we'll come back to more questions. Thank you. My name is Kaylee Becker, and I work at Broomfield Public Health and Environment, and addressing substance abuse prevention is a huge priority for us. And we have a really unique opportunity. We received a grant from the State Health Department to prevent substance use among youth. And we recognize that we cannot do this alone. So we have created a coalition of different community partners. And that includes parents, youth serving professionals, government agencies, and schools, many more. And their role is to really look at what's going on in the community. What is the substance use problem here? What's driving those behaviors? And also, what's going really well in Broomfield and what can we build upon? And they take that information and choose prevention strategies that will fit the needs of Broomfield. So we just wrapped up our first year, and we're really proud of the progress that we've made so far. We formed a coalition and has two boards, our key leader board, and they provide guidance and support for our initiative, and then we also have a community board. And those people are really on the ground working and looking at our data and the resources available in the community to inform our strategies. So, like I said, they are in the middle of doing an assessment, and they've looked at all the data, and they've talked amongst themselves, but now it's time to hear from you guys, the community. We want to know how you perceive this issue and what's going on in your lives. So we're in the very early stages of organizing a community discussion, and we invite you all to come, and we'll provide more information if you sign up for uh, more information on our, res on our list in the lobby. But again, the main goal is just you guys know our community best and what are you seeing on the ground. So from there, we'll do a little bit more work and look to see what resources are available, what's going really well, and um, where are those gaps that we can fill. So with that, we will prevent or implement prevention strategies to fit the needs of Broomfield. So there are a lot of ways for you guys to get involved if you're interested. You can sign up for our newsletter. It's called Be in the Loop. Um, and if you are interested in that, you can sign up on our sheet outside. We also invite you to join our coalition. So if you're interested in that, please let me know. There's a couple specific work groups that might be a really great fit for you, whether that's looking at the resources in the community or helping us engaging the public. Um, let's see. You can, like I mentioned earlier, be involved in our community conversations. So if you sign up, we will keep you informed about what dates and times those are because we'd really like to hear from you. And lastly, this is just one session in a three-part series. So we really do hope you come back. We will be talking more about marijuana and positive youth development and also mental health. So. There's a whole bunch of resources available outside, and please talk to me after if you want more information. 
And like Dr. Arbina said, we provided a lot of resources today, but we don't expect you to memorize them. So if you are interested, there is a resource list in the lobby. And with that, I will open up it up for questions. Or, or comments. Or comments. Yes. Question for Holly, back to your earlier slide. Sure. Where you, you said that the uh, prescribing opioids has quadrupled in what, from 2000 to whatever. The end of 1999 to about 2014. Has it come down? Sure. So again, for the sake of our video type, I'm going to repeat your question, if that's OK. Uh, she asked about um, uh, the, the rise in opioids, uh, and has it come down over that same period of time? And I'm going to go back all the way back to that slide. So if you look at, at the death. OK, so I didn't show us. I don't have that slide up here. But yes, the answer is yes, it has gone down. It's this one. It's this one. It has gone down. And it's going to, I didn't put that slide up here, but yes, the information we know now, not only are the desks are going down to opioids, but the number of prescriptions. And why is that? Um, what has happened as the CDC, all the doctors' organizations, American Medical Association, American Family, Family Practice, the anesthesiologist, the ER physicians, we've all said we're part of the problem. So what do we need to do about this? So now you're going to see going into your office to see your doctor, you're going to be asked a lot of questions about your history, which are not you personally, but generally. <laughs> but you're going to be asked about what have you used in the past? Have you considered other alternatives? Uh, you're going to be asked to sign a contract with narcotics. You're going to probably have a limited supply you're going to be altered, uh, offered alternative therapies. So we as physicians are taking this role very responsibly, and you're beginning to see a drop in the amount of opioids that are prescribed. But unfortunately, and why I show the, the issue around deaths, is you have the same addicted folks now turning to street heroin or synthetic fentanyl, or they're stealing or diverting other medications. You see it very commonly if you read the papers about people that have used opioids in the past are now diverting medications from the anesthesia cart or whatever. So that, unfortunately, is what's happening. Now we're trying to tackle that horse from getting out of the, out of the barn. So we've, yes, opioids are going down, but we've created other problems. And now we really have to encircle the entire herd and try to make a difference, not only with providers, but also pharmacies and and again, making available other treatment sources like what we talked about. And this slide. Because it isn't just the prescription use, but now we've decreated and have to deal with all the other issues associated with it. And I think that when you talk about communities that care, our hope is that we begin to look at those positive issues that are helping kids not turn to drugs or not, uh, or not use uh, opioids or heroin or, or marijuana or alcohol, doesn't matter what substance they could be using or abusing, so that they have resilience and positive reinforcement factors before they begin to use those things. And that's what Community That Care is all about, is trying to reinforce those things so we can get ourselves out of this hole that we've dug for ourselves, and I'm responsible as well. Did I answer your question? Probably too much information. <laughs> so there was some amazing information presented for both Chris and Kaylee. I'm interested as the public health director, what rings true to you in Broomfield as far as what was presented and what do you think is like, oh, we probably need to look at that more. No, that's not happening here in Broomfield. I'm really curious from your perspective out of all of the information presented, what do you think? Uh, she asked about where the, do we know where the access of heroin is coming from? Um, it, it multi places. You know, the, it's coming across the country. It's coming from south of the border. It's coming from other countries as well. And there's a whole bunch of synthetic uh, um, uh, opioids that are being produced in the laboratory as well. 
uh, derivatives of fentanyl and, and other compounds that aren't, aren't necessarily happening in Colorado, but if you read the paper, you're seeing they're happening in major cities. And many of the law enforcement agencies are becoming very frightened because this can be deadly to them as well if they bust somebody with a small amount of these synthetic opioids. It's very scary. And I, listening to law enforcement a lot, they're very worried. So it's coming from multiple sources. It just isn't one source, if I answered your question correctly. But uh, the, the big issue I hear from that uh, is that she's worried about the source and if we can deal any, any in, in, in dealing with that. And that's one thing we could definitely do is follow up with our chief of police and get some of that information so that as we have the community conversations, we can bring that out. So these are great questions of more information we could provide that can help tell the story. Other questions or comments? I used to teach GED courses at the Bloomfield Detention Center, and many of the inmates there um, were there on drug charges. Two questions. Um, do you think they should be, do you think that drugs should be treated as a crime or as a disease? many of them told me they didn't want to attend GED classes was because they feared, what difference does an education make anyway? I won't be able to get a job mm -hmm. when I get out and the whole ban or box uh, issue would, would be all of you. Sure. Sure. Uh, I'm going to repeat your question and your, co and, and, and your comment. She said that she used to teach GED classes in the jail. And her experience with many of the prisoners was, one, um, they didn't believe the GED was going to be helpful because of once they were found as a criminal by using drug or substance use, they were in this potential cycle going down, uh, and they couldn't get a job because it was on their criminal record. And then the first question part of that was that, um, do I think that drugs should be decriminalized uh, in terms of, of, of getting people? Uh, away from the jail and more quickly into treatment. I think that's what I heard you say. <laughs> Good. This is a very common question and very common problem. Uh, uh, police forces across the country and in Colorado are trying to cope with this. They and one police chief in, in Santa Fe, uh, who, who was very open about this, he said, these folks are criminals because they're addicts. If we treated their addiction, they would not be stealing or committing crimes. They're not dangerous. They're dangerous to themselves because they're stealing and abusing and they're a nuisance to us because there's this revolving door for, for jail sentences for these folks because they're stealing or committing crimes to get money to feed their addiction. So they had been thinking about in Santa Fe uh, and other places in the country of instead of putting folks in jail, of immediately just giving them the, the, the criminal uh, who's committed the crime um, a choice. Do you want to go to jail or do you want to go to treatment? And if you choose treatment, then we will help you with a case manager and try to get you training in the GED, try to help you get medically assisted treatment, and that's what that's about, MAT, um, to get you out of this cycle. And we had a, I heard a couple testimonies from people that had been through this program, and it seems to be working. Uh, part of the drug court? Uh, yeah, that's one piece of it, but it's an addition to the drug court. But again, it's a way of diverting people away from the criminal cycle and, this, and the downward uh, folk, uh, process that people go through when they're criminalized with related to drugs. Now, not, every, all, not all police are, forces are on board with this. Some people still believe that they're criminals and they're committed a crime and should serve a sentence. Now, this police chief happened to be saying, well, we don't believe that's working, and we want to do something different. And they're experimenting with it. And so far, they've been very successful. But it's expensive. And I said, so how do you deal with this? He said, well, so far, I haven't been able to divert money from this program to that program. But they were still struggling with that. So anyway, but it's a great question. And, and, and we, perhaps we could you know, bring that discussion up here in, in Broomfield. Because I think other counties are starting to have that discussion as well. And I was just uh, uh, mentioning Chief Krieger's 
actively involved in our community coalition um, that we talked about. And so again, joining efforts with our coalition is a great opportunity to bring these issues specifically up with our police chief and others to have those conversations. And I think you as community members, again, my opening statement was about you having the power of asking the questions of those, those folks who are in power to try to make a difference. You had a question. Yes. She, she mentioned this program, which I know very well. Uh, it's the ANGEL program in Longmont. It's uh, Jeff uh, Satour, who's the deputy chief is responsible. He and I went to Santa Fe together to listen to this program. Fabulous program. They call it the Police Assisted um, PARI, Police Assistant uh, Resource um, Help me out, Kayla. I, I wish I knew that I don't. <laughs> but the, the idea is to divert people away from the criminal justice system into treatment. And so far, it's been pretty successful. But it's very labor intensive. But, and he, Jeff, has done a great job. He says, well, either I spend my police force money in putting people into treatment, which is really they need, or I spend more time in jail trying to tackle these very difficult, very challenging, addicted folks. So. Thank you for mentioning that. What other questions do you guys have? Yes, or comment. Uh, the woman in the pink. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what effect are you seeing uh, on the foster, foster children and people needing services from Health and Human Services, specifically in Broomfield? I know nationwide Great question. there's a huge effect from the opioid epidemic. Yeah. epidemic. My understanding is that we are seeing an increased issue uh, specifically with uh, uh, children within our um, child abuse and neglect program over at Health and Human Services. I don't have the specific numbers off the top of my head, but I know heroin use and uh, opioids and uh, substances in general continually to be an, or, or an issue. And that's one nice thing in Broomfield is that compared to most other counties, we're integrated with our human services and our health department. And so we can do a lot of this joint work together and they're part of our coalition as well as we define where we're going. And then the second part of that is we have mental health partners actually located within our building as well. And so one thing that Chris and I have always strived to do is how do you break down those silos and those barriers within departments to really foster integration. And thankfully, our director of Health and Human Services is very supportive of the idea of integrating our services. Um, and so that's one thing. I know there are quite a few people from CASA here and others that would be great to, again, have that voice at the table as we start to develop solutions for youth of what makes the most sense here in Broomfield. But I do think we'll bring that, try to bring that data to the coalition. Because I do think uh, there are people that very care about these special population, and I do think we should address that as well. So, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, you had a question or a comment. I was actually just going to comment on the question of where is the heroin coming from. Okay. And I was going to make a recommendation of the book Dreamland. If anybody has um, read the book Dreamland, it's very interesting in that it talks about where the opioids epidemic started coming from, where all the heroin's coming from, all the cells that are moving in um, from Mexico. And unfortunately, Denver and Colorado Springs are very big cells for the drug trafficking that's coming up from Mexico. But um, I would just recommend that book to anybody who wants to read it. It's very fascinating to hear. She, she said uh, that the book, book Dreamland uh, is a good reference for where the opioid and heroin, particularly heroin epidemic started. She said that uh, Denver, unfortunately, Denver and Colorado Springs are both cells for a lot of the heroin traffic. Uh, she believes some of the Dreamland talks about it's coming from Mexico. But I think it's mul multiple countries. It's not just Mexico. That would be my guess. But I, I, thank you for bringing that up. Did you have a comment? Yeah, I'm curious to see, are we tracking um, the infants born that were addicted? Um, and then what That's a really good question, and um, as far as the Broomfield Communities That Care Coalition, we have a data worker that's looking into a lot of different data sources, and um, no, we haven't looked at that, but that's a really great recommendation, and we can do that. In I think long term. <coughs> yes. Mm -hmm. 
Our challenge is, is, is that um, babies are born all over. And, and Broomfield babies are born in Denver. <laughs> Uh, Denver babies are born in Broomfield. But I do think we can probably look at it statewide, or regionally, certainly the Denver Metro Public Health Departments can pull collectively that data, in a, but it's aggregate data. Uh, hospitals won't really release their one or two drug addicted babies, because again, for confidentiality, HIPAA, and I get that. But w it would be good to track that trend over time. Uh, and there are specific programs that are trying, in fact, one of the uh, hospitals uh, nurses was talking about, in your, in your case, uh, another nurse was saying, this is a struggle that we deal with every day. The pediatricians are dealing with the, the uh, drug-addicted uh, babies, which through no fault of their own, they happen to be born to a mom or dad, in, in many cases, that has been using drugs. So very important point, and we'll try to put that as our, one of our trackers as well. My daughter is an occupational therapist for children's, and she indicates that she actually the research that has been done that babies born to alcoholic mothers are worse off than babies born to opioid mothers. I'm glad you mentioned that. She said that her daughter, daughter? Yeah. Uh, again, I'm just repeating for the camera, uh, although I think it's an important point too. <laughs> um, that uh, drug addicted uh, babies are less, uh, what, me, alcohol addicted ba babies are have a harder time from an occupational therapy standpoint than drug-addicted babies. Uh, uh, they're both in trouble. Yes. Uh, and, and unfortunately, there are a lot more alcohol-addicted babies still. Hopefully, that will decrease than there are drug-addicted babies. But they're both important. And some of the re resilience factors, some of the community solutions are both important. The challenge for us as a community, if you haven't guessed this already, is that alcohol is legal. Marijuana is legal. Opioids with the safe use <laughs> and not diversion are legal. Heroin is not. So that we're dealing with the issues around people's choices or abuse of legalized substances. And that's one of the issues that we're going to be tackling in our community is because if I'm a beer drinker, I don't have a problem, right? It's them. If I'm a person with chronic neck pain, and it's not surgically repaired, I don't have a problem. But it's them. So we have to deal with our own issues. Uh, and I think ultimately we're going to have to have this frank discussion about use of legalized substances um, uh, that can be abused. Uh, and I'm being frank here, and I hope you don't mind me being frank, but I, as a physician, there's a fine line between abuse and use. And my mother, before she died, you know, would take off her oxygen um, and, uh, and have a cigarette, uh, and then she would back, take put out her cigarette and put her back oxygen, and you know, it was a slow killer for her. But she was addicted to tobacco, and that's a, it was legal, and and she until she died, uh, she continued to smoke. And so I, I as the nanny state, you know, the, the public health doctor, <laughs> I said, stop smoking. She said, who are you <laughs> to tell me to quit smoking? So they were dealing with also these emotional things as well. So, um, other questions or comments? Yes, sir. Just curious in the conversations you've had with, with the chief here um, through communities that care, whether there's been any discussion about um, a safe disposal uh, permanent box through the police department here in Broomfield, as you, as you referenced earlier on your slide, the Thornton's mm -hmm. Walgreens is the, is the closest one. I, I know that there's. There's a state program in place right now that really provides the funds and the resources so that every county in the state can have a, a permanent disposal box, and whether that's something that we can build as part of our community resources. His comment is about whether or not we had any discussions with police about uh, safe disposal boxes. In addition to the Thornton Walgreens, have we had that discussion, and should we include it in the, in the discussion going forward? Jason or Kaylee? Yeah, so um, we just began our conversations with um, the police department, and um, we know it's really important to have a safe disposal box in our county. The closest one is in Thornton, but I know the state is working on resources, like you mentioned, to have one in each county. Um, I don't know if that's something that the police department um, supports, and I'm sure they support it, but I'm not sure if that's on 
a priority for them at this point. Um, but I know that they are really interested in working with us and um, just doing everything they can to prevent substance use in the community. So. But thank you for bringing it up. We certainly will have that discussion as we go forward, Kent. Thank you. Other questions or comments? What kind of support are you guys offering for kids, families, or people who are struggling? So she asked, what kind of support are we offering for kids and families who, with people that are struggling? I would assume struggling with substance use. OK. So with our Broomfield Community Site Care Coalition, um, we're really in the planning stages right now. And we're looking just at that. What resources are available for families? And what resources are available for just teens in the neighborhood just to be active in a positive way? So that's something that we're looking at. Um, and then soon we're going to implement environmental prevention strategies. So those are things that reach the entire community um, and just give like a layer of prevention. So those things look like a mass media campaign to change norms, or um, working with different partners in the community to have safe spaces for kids to go after school and on the weekends. So that's really our focus right now is working on a community level, but there are um, different resources in place in Broomfield and, I don't know. Yeah, so we're, we're taking sort of multiple approaches to this. One is we have this very specific grant, and thankfully it's $103,000 per year over five years, and it's to identify those programs, but then to go out and get the funding so, to support the program so that when the grant goes away, that the programs don't. And so that's going to be a key thing for us, and that's one of the major aspects of having that key leaderboard is those are the champions in the community that can help us go find the funding to make sure this is sustainable. The second thing is that we're having the conversations not just from a youth substance abuse prevention aspect, but we're looking at health much broader. And typically in the past, the way we looked at health and public health was just physical health. So did you have cardiovascular disease? Did you smoke? Uh, did, did, have, you, have you had lung cancer? More and more realizing the role in public health is to look at overall holistic health and wellness. And we can't do it all in public health. Our job is to make those connections in the community of those people that, that can be either the ones that do the intervention, the screening, or the treatment, and foster that and make that happen more in our community. So we like to call ourselves the conveners in the community of bringing those players around the table and making sure that we're connecting the dots that there truly is a comprehensive approach instead of just there's this program happening over there, this program happening here, and this program happening there. So to answer your question, we're in the initial stages of doing that by going out, having conversations with providers, having these types of conversations, looking at our data. But really, it's going to be defining and developing those programs and then going out and getting the funding to actually implement the programs, not only just for us at the health department, but for those like mental health partners, if they need support, helping them go get the funding that they need. If it's getting a um, safe disposable program here in Broomfield, how do we go about doing that? That's our job is to connect the dots and to make those things happen. Mm -hmm. So that's a great point. One other piece that I think I heard you ask as well is, is are there resources now? And yes, there are. Some of these websites that we talked to, some of the partners in terms of mental health, some of the medically assisted uh, treatment programs, some of the local pediatricians that we're having conversations with already offer services. But they're not well known. They're not well known to you. They're not well known to many of the nurses in the hospital. So we're, our part of our plan mm -hmm. is to talk about them, to talk about and value them so that, they, that people who are in need can get help there or people that, you know, let's say it's law enforcement, they need a uh, mental health account, well, we make sure we pair them with that person. So part of that convening is to find out what those resources are so we can get people to those needed resources. Because right now we're, offering, we're operating, as, Je as Jason said, in silos, and you as a consumer or you as a client don't know what those resources are. So we're gonna do all of that to talk about what exists, what we need to, uh, improve on 
and how we do this from a community level, if that answers, helps answer your question. So you'll see more of us. We'd really like to have your input uh, as we go forward. So thank you for that comment. Yes? I'm addressing this to all three of you. Has there been any talk about educating about how drugs work sure. in, in the body, again going back to jail, uh, I would talk with the inmates. I used to teach anatomy and physiology, so I would explain to them what was going on in their bodies. And it was another world. They, had, they knew the high that they got. They didn't know anything about how the operation went. It was a good opportunity to work in some science education. But um, I don't think very many sure. people understand how drugs work. Sure. Sure. She, she said, uh, she asked, what are we doing about educating folks about how drugs work in their body? And hopefully that would be a, a way of, uh, for me to ch hopefully not choose to use drugs. What are we doing in that area to educate young people? Well, that's part of our coalition. We are working with schools, schools and programs that are trying to tackle these issues as early as middle, middle school are trying to tackle what we need to reinforce in terms of that educational and uh, alternatives to using drugs. So both are important. I, my mother knew the, that cigarettes were bad for her, but that, and she was a nurse. Uh, and so that didn't really change her behavior. So we have to do both. We have to understand as a person to understand why, how it works and how it affects us, but also we have to give alternatives for treatment uh, to get her off that abuse, as well as other support factors that help maintain their, their clean cleanliness off of drugs. So we're trying to tackle that at multiple levels, if I answered your question correctly. Jason? And just supporting that, we have a teen council here in the city and county of Broomfield, and so we've had presentations to that teen council specifically on the physiological aspects of uh, drugs and how it impacts your body. The one thing I would just add to what Chris said, it's an and situation is, uh, oh, I used to work a lot in tobacco prevention and control, uh, and it is a substance uh, use issue. Often when we would talk to teens, it was, that's never gonna happen to me because that's gonna happen to me 50 years from now. And so it's how do you have that conversation of changing that social and community norm? And some, a lot of it is the peer pressure that they're facing or overestimation of how much their peers are using substances. And so it's having the conversation exactly what you're saying, but a broader conversation, a well of trying to change those social norms. Just to add to that, we're also leveraging existing resources in the community. Um, and we presented Rise Above Colorado, and they created, their teen council created a website for teens by teens. So it's very different than just an adult saying, this X, Y, and Z is gonna happen to you if you use drugs. This is actually coming from a teen who really knows what that conversation looks like. So we encourage teens to um, go to that website and make their own healthy decisions that's best for them. One last comment, and then I think we're going to stop because I want to keep you out uh, on time. And then if you have individual questions, you can come up uh, afterwards to, to tell me about your sore knee or ankle. <laughs> yes, Kent. Thanks for just mentioning that. But our organization with Rise Above Colorado, we actually do have um, some school and after-school-based programming that addresses what you were asking in terms of uh, understanding the impact of um, various substances, including prescription opioids on the body, so we do a, we have a program called Not Prescribed that actually, I know our, a health, the health teacher at Greenfield Heights Middle School, for example, she uses that as part of her curriculum. It's a single day lesson, but it helps them understand the impact um, as it relates to um, the adolescent developing brain, because that's a, the brain science piece is, I think, a really important piece for youth to understand, again, physiologically, how and why addiction happens at a higher rate because of that fact, and so we do talk about that in pretty interactive way, too. So there are resources out there finding times and opportunities to get them at, at the level of depth that we would all like. Uh, it's always challenging given what's on place of you know, school and educator, educators and health educators in particular. But there are some resources there. So a couple things I want to say thank you for coming. I want to invite you to our next series. I'm going to talk a little bit about marijuana and its effect on the body and what you can do 
please come. It's July 27th, and then we're going to end with mental health issues. I want to thank Kaylee and, and Jason and Allison and the whole team, Courtney, Heather, for helping put this all together. And if you want to stay involved, come to the series, but also sign up, and we'll keep you engaged and invite you. Your, your input is very valuable to us. And again, have a good evening. And have a safe fourth. <laughs>